Hello and welcome to the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation's webinar on dystonia and medical cannabis. I am Janet Heischetter and it's my privilege to serve as the Executive Director for the DMRF. The DMRF is committed to supporting research that will lead to better treatments and ultimately a cure for all forms of dystonia. The Foundation also knows that the science can never move fast enough for those who are waiting for answers, so we are committed to providing programs of education, awareness, advocacy, and support for those who are affected and their families and friends. Our topic tonight is one that many people in the dystonia community are interested in, medical cannabis and dystonia. We're fortunate and pleased to have as our speaker tonight Dr. Danny Bega from Northwestern Medicine. Dr. Bega received his medical degree from Rush University here in Chicago, where he also did his internship. Dr. Bega then did a residency in neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He returned to Chicago to do a fellowship in neurology and movement disorders at Northwestern University. Um, where he is now uh, an assistant professor of neurology, um, and we're really pleased to, to have him tonight. Dr. Bega has been a frequent speaker for the DMRF and other patient organizations. We're grateful to him for his willingness to help us understand what we know and what we don't know about medical cannabis and how it might help those who are affected by dystonia. Dr. Bega, welcome, and I'll turn the program over to you. Okay, um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and I just want to thank the DMRF for inviting me to speak um, and for uh, uh, getting people uh, interested in this talk. Um, I think it's a topic that is really important and, and I think naturally interesting to a lot of people. Um, and I think there are so many questions in the community uh, people dealing with dystonia and other diseases about medical cannabis. So um, I think this is a really important topic and one that I like talking about. Um, while I like talking about it, I, I, I have to say I, I wish I could answer all the questions that everybody has about dystonia and cannabis, um, but there are a lot of unanswered questions. And if I can promise one thing, it's to give you a sense of what I know um, and what the medical community knows and doesn't know. Um, to give you a better sense of what questions and answers you can expect or should expect from your doctors um, and, and what, what information is, is based in science and, and what is not um, at this point in time. I think I was asked to give this talk because uh, I am a movement disorder specialist. I, I have expertise in dystonia. I'm not a cannabis expert, uh, but I do have an interest in alternative uh, complementary treatments in general. Um, and uh, I would say more self-taught with regard to the, the science behind cannabis, because unfortunately it's not a topic that we learn about in medical school, um, certainly not when I was going to medical school. Um, and uh, it's, it's an area that a lot of doctors feel is a weakness actually, because, because it's not something that we learn uh, uh, early on in our training. Um, I'm gonna uh, just uh, have some brief objectives here. Um, I'm gonna, give an introduction to why we would even talk about cannabis with regard to dystonia. And it's more than just because people want to use it because it's becoming more and more legalized. Um, there's, there's a rationale for why this is an important topic, why we should be interested in it. Um, uh, and we'll talk about the potential role specifically in dystonia. We'll use um, some other diseases uh, to, to borrow uh, in terms of evidence, uh, because unfortunately the evidence specifically in dystonia um, in terms of, of clinical trials where it's been used in patients that we can look to for evidence is, is lacking. Um, and we'll talk about what some of the needs are, what we don't know, and what we need to know to move forward. Just some disclosures. I don't have any disclosures relevant to this topic. I'm not uh, compensated in any way uh, for giving this uh, talk on this topic. I do have some disclosures that are listed here relevant to uh, some uh, companies that I either speak for or do, uh, do consulting work for, uh, but none of these are directly relevant to dystonia or to cannabis. Um, and so I know we probably have listeners who dealing with all different forms of dystonia. And so just very briefly, not all dystonia is the same. And we use the word dystonia sometimes when we're describing a disease state itself that uh, uh, that there are genetic forms of dystonia, where dystonia is the, is the condition, is the disease. 
um, that someone has. The dystonia can also be used to describe a symptom. So someone with a disease like Parkinson's can have dystonia as a symptom, or someone uh, who's had a particular kind of injury to the brain can have a dystonia as a symptom. So dystonia can be the, the disease that someone presents with, um, or it can be a symptom of another disease. Um, and even there, dystonia can be uh, local, localized to one body region, or it can be uh, occurring in many body regions. The most common dystonia we see is, is in the neck, um, but you can see dystonia involve other body regions as well. You can see a generalized form or a focal form. And really interestingly, you can even see forms of dystonia that come out only with specific taps. Shown here is a, a, a musician playing the guitar who's developing some dystonia in his hand, which only occurs when he plays the guitar, a musician's dystonia. So dystonia has some unique and interesting features where um, uh, it can be task specific for some people and, and not for others. So there's lots of kinds of dystonia. Um, and so sometimes we refer to them as primary dystonias and secondary dystonias, sometimes focal, sometimes segmental, sometimes generalized. There's a lot of ways to describe dystonia. We don't fully, with, with good uh, uh, ability to explain exactly the, understand the, what is happening in the brain and the nervous system uh, in all dystonias. We know that dystonia doesn't actually, the problem we don't think is in the muscle itself or in the nerves themselves. Um, we think the problem originates in the brain. And uh, it's uh, to some extent a chemical problem related to dopamine and other chemicals in the brain. Um, to some extent, it's, it's related to the pathways themselves that go from the brain to the muscles um, and signals that uh, coordinate movement becoming overactive in some areas. Um, but the problem is not thought to be in the area that looks affected itself. It's actually thought to be in the brain. And we'll talk about that and how that's relevant to how cannabis might work in dystonia. So dystonia leads to these uncontrollable muscle contractions, distorted movements, twisting movements, as you tried to show in some of those still photos, but it's easier to, to see in some uh, videos. Um, but it leads to these abnormal postures uh, of, of different body parts. And the major complaints that people will describe related to this is uncontrolled movement, um, spasming, stiffening, sometimes tremors, pain, uh, and, and muscle stiffness. Um, and conventional treatments that we use, um, typically they target these specific symptoms. They don't, the treatments that we have don't, uh, for the most part, don't treat the underlying disease, but they, they try and control these symptoms. And this is a display of the sort of typical management that you would get uh, seeing a neurologist for dystonia. We have oral medications that we may try. We have uh, botulinum toxin, which is sort of a mainstay of treating a lot of the focal dystonias. Um, we have surgical approaches in, in, case, in some cases of severe dystonia, including deep brain stimulation. Um, and there are other treatments like, that are very important as well, like physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, other devices that may be implemented. And this is sort of the array of traditional approaches. But these leave um, a lot to be desired, and, and, and they have some limitations. And so some of these conventional treatments leave people with an inadequate response. Some of these treatments leave people with a, a short-lasting response. Um, some of these treatments have side effects. So all medications have some side effects that are possible. Um, and then um, they, they, they really focus on the specific motor uh, problems like stiffness or pain, uh, but they may fail to address some of the non-motor issues that we, we often see along with dystonia. So we know people with movement disorders in general often don't just have the movement disorder but they can have a, a non-motor problem along with it, like a cognitive problem, a sleep problem, an anxiety problem. Not everybody with dystonia will have these issues, but we see it a lot. 91% of people in this one particular study um, from a few years back, 91% of people with dystonia also had some other psychiatric illness like depression or social phobia or panic disorder or anxiety or obsessive compulsive tendencies. So there are other parts to the conditions that people deal with that are not addressed specifically by medications that focus on, on spasms, for instance. And, and we see that people turn to non-conventional treatments all the time, not, not just in dystonia, but in a lot of diseases. Um, uh, the NIH lists it, uh, that natural products are among the highest used by people in terms of non-conventional or alternative complementary treatments. Uh, about 20% of people were using 
uh, natural products is sort of the most common. Uh, and obviously, that has relevance to what we're going to talk about today. And this is a list of some of the other non-conventional uh, uh, treatments that people sometimes seek. So, and, and why do they do this? I mean, I already mentioned some of the limitations of conventional treatment. Why do people look look outside of conventional treatment? For some people, philosophically, just you know, Western medicine is something that they philosophically have cultural beliefs about or a desire for kind of a more holistic approach to healthcare. Um, I think it can never hurt to have a holistic approach to healthcare that incorporates Western approaches and, and alternative complementary options. Um, so for some people, it's wanting to have some personal control over an illness, some, some power over your condition that uh, when you look to some of these non-conventional treatments, you may, you may feel that there's some empowerment to that. Um, sometimes it's just simply dissatisfaction with the options that are available to you, side effects, invasive procedures, et cetera. Um, sometimes it's media attention. I mean, some things just get more popular attention and are attractive to people, and that leads people to want to look down those paths. And certainly cannabis is, is an example of that, where there's a lot of attention put on it, both among uh, 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 people in kind of day-to-day -day life that you may encounter, um, but also in the media. Um, and so it's, it's important that we address it because of that. Not necessarily a reason to, to pursue it, but a reason to at least uh, bring it up with your doctor and, and discuss it. And then additional factors that tend to predict using alternative treatments, um, being female, being younger, sometimes people with higher levels of education tend to, this is just kind of statistically who tends to use alternative treatments. And sometimes you're with people with poorer health status, maybe because of desperation over the lack of benefits that they may be getting from some conventional treatments. Um, so in a survey of people with dystonia, 53% of people in this one particular survey were using at least one form of CAM. CAM stands for complementary and alternative medicine for their symptoms. Um, and many were using it along with conventional treatments like botulinum toxin injections. I think this is a, I mean, complementary and alternative medicine in general is a growing industry in terms of uh, financial industry as well. You can see about $40 billion were out of pocket expenses that people were spending on non approved medications, treatments, and, and uh, devices and uh, interventions for their conditions. Uh, that, was, that was years ago. That number has increased significantly since then. And at the same time, patients will come to us as, as physicians a lot with, with questions about this. And a lot of times, I think they get discouraged by the physician response. And um, I think some of that is because uh, one is the physician is concerned about a lack of scientific evidence. It's hard to specifically put yourself out there and recommend something or recommend against something when you don't have the data to, to back yourself up, well-designed trials to back up your recommendations. The trials that we have often for some of these conditions and cannabis is definitely one of these where the, the studies that we have are often poorly done, not well powered, not generalizable enough. Um, and we have a lot of issues with dealing with things like internet testimonials, things that people see on YouTube and trying to use that. The discrepancy between that and what's in the actual scientific evidence is important to acknowledge that there is a discrepancy that we uh, that sometimes when things seem too good to be true, it's because they are. Um, uh, and uh, really, we need good good science to, to show us whether something works. Um, sometimes it's simply discomfort with level of knowledge or lack of training. As I mentioned, most of us have not had training specifically about marijuana, about cannabis products. Um, and there's you know potential for legal concerns about uh, using a product or discussing a product that you don't know much about. Um, and then uh, concerns about patients using potentially costly or risky therapies. So even some therapies that people think are safe, that maybe herbal treatments that people think are, are natural, even natural products can sometimes have toxicities, can sometimes interact with other medications. And, um, and so those are, those are concerns that drive some of the physician discouragement. But having said that, um, this is what the map of the United States looks like right now, despite the paucity of evidence this is what the map looks like of, of states where cannabis is, is available in some form or another. And what you're seeing in uh, the darkest color is the states where it's actually fully legalized and recreationally available. Um, in, the, in the darker green color, you can see states where it's medically available. Um, and uh, in the, um, uh, uh, the lighter green, you can see the states where it's fully illegal. 
um, not, not only recreationally, but also medically illegal. Um, and so the state where I practice is, is Illinois, and we've just recently, we, we've been uh, medically uh, allowed to prescribe uh, or, or to recommend cannabis products uh, from certain medical conditions. And in, uh, uh, we've just recently, uh, the decision has been made by the governor to actually make it uh, recreational starting in January. And you can see this is a move where we'd now be, I think, the 10th or 11th state to make it recreationally available, meaning fully legalized by the state. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about this. Uh, for uh, a lot of excitement on one side from some people and a lot of concerns on the other end. Um, this is in Illinois, the list of debilitating conditions where it's medically appropriate uh, by the state to use uh, medical marijuana. And dystonia, as you can see highlighted, is one of the conditions in, in my state where it comes up. So, um, I'm going to I'm going to start by like why why cannabis as a medicine in the first place? Where would this idea even come from? Um, this is a picture of a tomb from uh, China from uh, about uh, 2700 years ago of a, a, a medicinal a healer, a, a shaman who was buried and the burial conditions were such that there were well preserved large amounts of cannabis that were discovered in this in this grave uh, of this doctor of, of sorts. Um, and so um, uh, cannabis goes back a very long time. Um, it's been used as a symptom reliever throughout history for analgesia, which means pain relief, for sedative effects, for effects on inflammation, on muscle spasms, and on seizures. And all of these uh, have been uses of it uh, throughout history. Um, it was actually brought to the Western world by this physician, W.B. O'Shaughnessy, brought it uh, uh, to treat Queen Victoria's menstrual, menstrual cramps from uh, India in the 1800s, he brought it over um, to, to treat her. Um, so it has, a, it has a long history as, as a medicine. Um, cannabis is really a complicated product, and you've probably heard about lots of different terms from THC and CBD and all of these different terms. It actually contains over 400 chemical compounds. The ones that we're going to focus on are the THC and the CBD. The THC is the main psychoactive component. This is the part that gets people high. The CBD or the cannabidiol, it, it has an effect on the THC. It actually may have a, a effect on lowering the negative effects of the THC, uh, the, side, the psychiatric side effects of the THC. And it itself does have some, some effects by itself as well, um, uh, which, are a little bit less clear, but, uh, but also has effects in the, on the brain um, that may be related to pain and uh, inflammation and other things. Um, terpenoids are the component that give it the strange smell that it has um, and may affect the chemical serotonin as well, which is an important chemical for mood. Um, and then flavones, flavones are antioxidant properties that, that uh, the cannabis has, um, which is one of the reasons why, why it's been discussed as a way of maybe slowing down some uh, diseases, uh, why it's been proposed for things like inflammation and cancers and things like that, although the evidence uh, may not be there. But the, the, pro the, the, the basis for it is, is based on this chemical piece. So interestingly, throughout our brains, we have cannabis receptors. So CB here stands for cannabis receptors. So we have uh, CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors, so different kinds of receptors that are in our nervous system that actually the cannabis binds to. Um, and the, the cannabis receptors are the second most densely populated receptors in our brains. And so for no other reason, I would say we should be talking about cannabis because cannabis receptors are everywhere. There must be some application for them if there are so many receptors for them in the brain. Cannabis receptors are also found in the immune system and on inflammatory cells, and that's the CB2 receptors primarily. And the, the areas where they're the most densely populated are the basal ganglia. That's the part that's the, the motor area that is the most involved in dystonia and other movement disorders. That's the highest concentration along with the cerebellum, the area that is involved in coordination. And then also, fortunately, or, or potentially unfortunately, there may be receptors, a lot of receptors in the hippocampus, which is the memory area, in addition to other areas of the brain. There's also a lot of um, uh, receptors in spinal cord sensory areas. So the part of the spinal cord that would be responsible for uh, receiving pain signals have a lot of uh, cannabis receptors, and that may be important. So this is a distribution example. Uh, at the top, I have a rat brain. 
Um, and in orange, you can see the distribution uh, where it's most densely orange is where the densest cannabis receptors are. Um, in the back, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I'm just uh, circling it right now, but in the back, um, sort of toward the left of the picture is the cerebellum, it's the balance area, and deeper down, this is the basal ganglia, this is the area that controls motor function. Um, and uh, you can see a map of the human brain below, and on that in green is shown those areas that are really important in dystonia, which is the deep areas there in green, labeled GP, which is globus pallidus, P, which is putamen. These areas are really important for, for movement and for overactive movement, and there's a lot of cannabis receptors in those areas. Why do we have these? Well, we certainly don't have them just so that we can get high. We have these receptors because we make our own forms of cannabis naturally that bind to these receptors. Um, and so there's a lot of chemicals in our brain that bind to these cannabis receptors that are important for things like immune function, appetite, pain control, inflammation, and other things. So there's a theory that throughout evolution they developed to help us forget about pain because there are so many in the, in the memory areas and the pain areas. And so maybe it evolved for that reason, who knows? But needless to say, there are natural cannabinoids that we, use, that we make that bind to these areas. And so an important chemical in our brains, and this is probably the most scientific I'm gonna get uh, throughout the talk. So the mo the, there's a chemical in our brain called GABA, which is a really the main chemical that our brain sends to inhibit signals, to reduce si signals. Um, and it interacts with a lot of other chemicals in our brain, a lot of other neurotransmitters. And cannabis binding in this deep part of the brain actually enhances the release of this chemical, of this GABA chemical. Um, and by doing so, maybe you could propose that it should reduce excessive movement. This would be the kind of the, pat, the, the logic, the theory of how cannabis might be important in dystonia. Um, dystonia is uncontrollable movement, excessive contractions, distortions, twisting movements. So if you had a chemical that affected, uh, that bound and affected chemicals that cause inhibition of movement, could it relax those muscles? Could it reduce some of that excessive movement by, by its effect on GABA and other chemicals? And um, I have this slide here on deep brain stimulation only because I want to show, again, how we've always targeted dystonia. One of the most effective treatments, while also the most invasive, is deep brain stimulation for, for dystonia, incredibly effective for fo some forms of dystonia. And the target where the lead, where the electrode goes, is in this blue area here, um, and this is the globus pallidus. And this is the area that um, is the most densely populated when you look at the map that I have up here in green, the most densely populated with cannabis receptors. So again, the area that we're targeting when we use deep brain stimulation, which we know is effective for dystonias, um, is the same area that's really densely populated by cannabis receptors and essentially is a target of the, a lot of the cannabis products that are being used. Unfortunately, they don't specifically target this, this, this part of the brain. They would bind to all parts of the brain, but, but densely populated in that part. And I think that's important. So what's the evidence for using cannabis as medicine? So, so far this is all theoretical. But we can learn a little bit from other conditions. So we actually have very good evidence that cannabis helps with appetite and nausea. It was approved in the 1980s for nausea related to chemotherapy. Um, in 1992, it was approved for wasting in people who had AIDS, who were, uh, had trouble with eating and keeping weight on. Um, we know that it has effects on mood. We know that blocking cannabis receptors can cause depression, at least in animal models, it's been shown to do that. It can increase anxiety, can uh, cause lack of interest in doing things. And then cannabis receptors in uh, are, I mentioned in a lot of areas that are related to pain, and, and we know that there's some evidence that it affects the response to pain. So this is an example from a small study, 55 people with, who had uh, neuropathy or nerve damage from HIV, and they showed that they were able to reduce their pain response using cannabis. So um, uh, they, what they did was they gave them placebo cigarettes or cannabis cigarettes, so fake cigarettes, that only had the, the smell component of cannabis, so they could smell it, but they weren't actually getting any active ingredient, um, or they were, they were actually smoking uh, cannabis three times a day for five days. And then they put this burning cream on their skin to see the area of skin that got painful and, and uh, sensitive, and they mapped it out, and they saw that people who were using cannabis 
had a reduced pain by about 34% compared to the group who was getting the placebo. Here's another uh, uh, pain study. These were people who had all different kinds of pain, 21 people with either muscular pain or migraines or, again, nerve pain or cancer pain who were taking narcotics, morphine and oxycodone, which we know are not safe medications. Um, and they were given vaporized cannabis for five days. And what they showed was from day one to day five, the amount of narcotics that they were requiring went down significantly. You can see the numbers there in the day one column compared to the numbers in the day five column show that their need for morphine and oxycodone was reduced. This is a study from multiple sclerosis. So in multiple sclerosis, people get stiffening of muscles, a spasticity of their muscles. And so you might think about some of the muscle problems as, as being somewhat similar to dystonia in that it's the problem is not in the muscle, the problem is in the, the brain or the spinal cord, and it's causing stiffening of muscles. Um, and here they, they, used, uh, they compared people getting uh, THC uh, to people getting a cannabis extract of some sort to, to a placebo group. And they looked at their stiffness score, that's what this Ashworth score is on the left, and they saw the lower, the lower numbers are better. They saw improvement in their stiffness score, although they also saw improvement in the placebo group, um, uh, which is a, a reason that studies need to be done, because you can see even people getting placebo do get benefits, and that's why we need to study things in a systematic, in an evidence-based way to know if they really work. They looked at their walking abilities, and they did see, again, improvement in people using cannabis in their ability to walk, Although, if you look, the placebo group also improved in their ability to walk. There might be a difference here between the placebo and the treatment group, but yeah, uh, so while there was benefit, you have to take into account that some of this benefit was a placebo response. This was looking at um, the same uh, uh, people, people with MS, looking at muscle stiffness, body pain, sleep quality, so not just motor symptoms in this case, also looking at some non-motor issues like sleep. And they did show improvement if you compare the cannabis group to the placebo group from week four to week eight to week 12, you start to see um, some improvement in some of these symptoms over time. Um, there are also some side effects uh, that were listed here. And you could see in the study, there was a much higher rate in the cannabis group compared to the placebo of people getting dizziness. So 46% of them got dizzy. Um, you can see other things like dry mouth, urinary tract infections for whatever reason, so you can see there were some side effects in the group getting cannabis. Um, Parkinson's disease have done, they've done some studies uh, on cannabis um, and, they, and some people with Parkinson's get, get dystonia as a symptom. Um, here the data is, is, is uh, not great also. Uh, the studies, there have not been a lot of studies. There are some, this is basically a list of all of the studies that were, that, that were reviewed, kind of put together in one slide, compiled together. And they're inconsistent. I mean, the best quality studies, which are the randomized control, placebo controlled studies, the ones that factor in the placebo response, you can see in one of them at the top, there was no improvement in some of the symptoms that they were looking at. Um, in some of the, uh, in one of the case series here, there were 22 people um, who were, this was not a high quality study because it's just a description. It wasn't a placebo controlled trial. But they did see improvement in tremor and in slowness of their movement. So here there was some benefit. But then again, you go to a randomized control trial of eight people and they saw no benefit. Um, so it, you can see there's a lot of variability. The studies aren't great. They're small. Uh, we usually like to see studies of drugs in the order of hundreds of people. So these are small studies. These are the, the numbers here, 17, 5, 22. And they're inconsistent in their results. And they're not all high quality studies. And this is the similar graph for dystonia now. So these are the studies that are available to review for dystonia. And we cut quickly to see that there's only two of them that were randomized placebo control trials. Um, and neither of them were of conventionally like smoked marijuana. One of them was a pill of a, of a lab made medication called nabilone that is meant to act like cannabis. And there was no improvement in dystonia in that group. And then in the other trial, it was another kind of synthetically made, lab-made form of cannabis. Again, no improvement in dystonia. You do have a case study of, unfortunately, only one person who was smoking cannabis who did show significant improvement in dystonia. So certainly this raises your interest in it, but it's not, a, it's not enough to base any recommendations on when you only see these small case studies of one person here, 
five people here, one person here, um, that's not data because as we know, placebo effects are important to factor in. And then when they do the higher quality studies, they're still small studies and they didn't show the significant benefits. So, so as a result of this, these are the guidelines that were put out a few years ago by the American Academy, uh, Academy of Neurology. And uh, I agree with this, that uh, unfortunately, unfortunately there is insufficient data at this time to support or refute the efficacy of oral cannabinoids because the studies are small and the results are inconsistent at this time. Um, but I think the other part is important too, that there's insufficient data to refute it also. So I think, I don't think anyone can tell you that you should or that you shouldn't necessarily use it yet. And I think that there's enough, um, there's enough uh, basis to support a need for better future studies, certainly. Unfortunately, this is the state of the current studies. Um, so clinicaltrials.gov lists all of the registered studies on a particular condition that you can look up at any time. Um, there were 267 studies that I found when I just typed in dystonia. But when I uh, specifically looked at studies that we're recruiting currently, there were 79. And then when you, uh, you look at those 79, which of them actually involved cannabis or cannabis products, it was zero. Most of those 79 were deep brain stimulation or botulinum toxin studies of some sort. And so you would ask, you know, why, why aren't there more studies? Um, and it's hard to point the finger at any one particular uh, reason. I think it, it's difficult to design these studies, first and foremost. I mentioned the real, really the importance of, of dealing with a placebo. Um, when someone is feeling a high, for instance, uh, we really worry that the placebo response could be playing an important role. It's really important to control for that, to make sure that the benefit they're getting isn't, is, is actually a, a scientific benefit. Um, there is uh, also the concern that people will know when they're getting the drug and when they won't because they feel the high or because if, if, it's, uh, if, if it's hard to control for something like the smell of the, of the marijuana, they'll know if they're getting the real drug. Um, and so it's hard to mask that. Um, it, it's hard to, it's also hard to um, get these, uh, get the drug to obtain it, to do the study. And, and while it's becoming a little easier as states are, 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 are legalizing it, remember that while states are legalizing it more and more, it's still federally illegal. And a lot of the funding comes from federal uh, grants and, uh, and that, has, that has to change to make things easier. Um, and uh, even when it is obtainable, sometimes there are restrictions um, on where it can be obtained from. So meaning I, I'm, I'm aware of one study that was done in Parkinson's where they needed, where they got approval to obtain cannabis to do their study, but they needed to obtain it from one specific farm. And that was the only farm that was allowed uh, for them to use, to use their cannabis. And, and if that's not the strain that they wanted or the concentration that they wanted, they were still stuck with using that. And then most importantly, who are the people doing the studies? They're scientists, right? And there's a void in the knowledge base for physicians and for scientists of, uh, about, uh, about the topic. And so if we don't know a lot about the topic, it's gonna be hard for us to design studies, um, to dedicate our time, to devote our time to designing studies until we're more educated on the topic to begin with. I did a survey a few years back to ask about movement disorder specialists around the world and their experience and their knowledge about cannabis. And of the 55 movement disorder specialists that were surveyed uh, across five countries and 14 states, only 23% reported any formal education about cannabis. And that might've been as little as one course that they took on cannabis. So it something, could have been something very simple. Only 23% of them had that, even that simple exposure. And where they were actually reporting getting their information about cannabis from, well, a little under 50% were actually getting it from the medical literature because the medical literature is so sparse on the topic. And so a lot of the knowledge for physicians is unfortunately coming from similar places to where patients and families are getting their information, personal experience, media, opinions, um, you know, talking to other people about it. And that's not where you want your information from. When you go to your doctor, you don't want them giving you their input based on uh, based on what's in the media, you want them giving it to you based on what their knowledge is, what the evidence is. And so this is a, this is a problem right now. Um, we have some evidence about adverse events and we have to remember that too. Um, 
I mentioned that all medications have side effects. Well, a lot of natural products also can have side effects. And there's no question that there are some side effects associated with cannabis, and we have to be more knowledgeable about them in order to weigh the risks and benefits. Because like medications, if cannabis is effective, it's not going to be the right choice for everybody um, with any particular condition. And there are going to be certain people where it's going to be more appropriate for than others. And it's going to have to be based and weighed against the, their potential for certain side effects. Now, the most common side effects with cannabis have been, that have been reported in studies have been drowsiness, fatigue, dizziness, dry mouth, cough, that was mainly with the, of course, with the smoked form, anxiety, nausea, um, cognitive effects, uh, blurred vision, headaches. And then, but rarely you could see things even like low blood pressure, depression, uh, balancing coordination, um, uh, GI side effects. Uh, gastrointestinal side effects, things like that. Um, and then you add on top of it that some people with dystonia have a neurodegenerative condition. Um, some people with dystonia are maybe more prone to certain side effects if they have a neurodegenerative disease, um, meaning uh, a good example is people um, who have uh, dystonia that's secondary to something like Parkinson's. Um, they may be more prone to some side effects like cognitive issues. Some, some primary dystonia, some genetic forms of dystonia are, can be associated with cognitive issues to begin with, and that, those people would be more prone to getting cognitive problems as a side effect. Um, other adverse events that are kind of more debated, uh, you know, effects on driving, we think that there is fairly good evidence that it can have negative effects on driving. Uh, THC is frequently found in the blood and urine of drivers after accidents. There may be a confounder here of Alcohol is also found in a lot of those drivers who are smoking marijuana, uh, but, but still it's something to be concerned about. Potential for long-term effects, uh, people, uh, especially with inhaled forms and smoked forms, uh, potential for respiratory effects, um, like inflammation of the lungs uh, or emphysema have been described, um, and some of that is debated. And the psychiatric effects. So we think of it, for some people, we think it might be useful to treat their anxiety or their panic, but it's also been reported to cause acute panic problems and anxiety problems in certain people, and potentially that's specific to certain strains. Um, but it's not, that's not exactly clear, and how to guide people with regard to that isn't clear either. Um, how might it affect motivation to do day-to-day -day things? How might it affect cognition? How might it affect weight? All of these things need to be thought about. Um, cognition is the one I'm most worried about because I take care of people with neurological illnesses. Um, this is one study from uh, people with multiple sclerosis again, and it showed um, we, we know that there are uh, short-term effects on cognition. Everybody's aware that when people are high, for instance, their attention is impaired, their concentration is impaired. Um, they may be more impulsive. But what about long-term effects? And so there may even be long-term effects of use, um, which we didn't think there were initially. Uh, but there have been more and more studies showing that even long-term uh, there can be effects on decision-making, on risk-taking behaviors, maybe on inhibition, maybe on language skills, other things. May, may, there may be long-term cognitive consequences. And while the, the, the most robust area where the cannabis receptors are is in the motor area, they still, there still are cannabis receptors in the memory centers and in the other cognitive centers in the brain. Um, and, and, you can't, and we're not specifically targeting one, si one part of the brain or another, unfortunately. And then there's the practicalities. And I, to me, this is the most complicated because while I think I have some, some uh, maybe more understanding about cannabis than the average physician, um, this is where I, I run into a lot of my barriers is how, how do you guide people? Um, and I know this is a lot of the questions that people probably have is who's going to guide me if I do use it? Um, and I would say back up and let's, let's prove that it is effective first. But, but let's say we do, let's say we can. Um, what strain should you use? What dose should you use? What concentration should you use? And who's going to guide you? And right now, I think when people, what people are finding is they're, they're having to rely on the dispensary person who probably is the most knowledgeable about cannabis and different strains, um, and their physician can't really guide them. Um, and and how, are, how is the physician supposed to guide them if, if we haven't studied all the different forms and all the different flavors and varieties and types? And they are all different. Um, and so let's start starting with like, what about the difference between oral and inhaled? So um, there is some, some evidence that oral cannabis, um, a good example of this is like pot brownies, um, oral cannabis uh, may have more potential for psychiatric side effects. 
So when it's metabolized orally, it gets cleared through the liver, and uh, there's a metabolite that actually can have more psychiatric side effects. Um, and so maybe from a psychiatric standpoint, it might be safer to use inhaled forms, um, vaped forms or inhaled forms, and that's something that needs to be thought about. Um, what about absorption about from inhaled versus, uh, versus uh, edible forms? Uh, absorption certainly should be different. I would think that inhaled forms would absorb faster than forms that have to go all the way through the stomach and get absorbed uh, that way. Um, and so people who are looking for quick relief might need to think about that. Um, what, aren't there probably dis different distributions of cannabis receptors in people's brains? And that's something I think would be interesting to look into. Some people are probably more sensitive, um, and for some people probably have a, uh, more cannabis receptors in certain areas of the brain than others, and, and, and it's, I'm sure there's some variability from person to person. And how, is that, how should that factor into how we dose it and how we use it? And then you get into different strains. So uh, very basically, here you have the sativas and the indicas. And this is, this is like really a basic way to think about it is like the sativa is the one that's more uh, is, uh, the upper and the indica is the downer. So sativa is the one that gets you more high, uh, that gives you more uh, cravings for food, um, that may make you more creative, that kind of classic high. Um, whereas the indica might be the one to consider for more sedative effects or anxiety relieving effects or sleep promoting effects. Um, because it has more of the CBD than the THC. Um, but there, even within that, there's a lot of combinations of THC to CBD formulation. So, so that's, that's something that needs to be considered, um, whether it's the sativa or indica strain, but also the, C, the THC and CBD concentration. Um, when you look at these studies, nobody's really even paying attention yet to what is the concentration of CBD versus THC that I should be looking at for a particular disease. And it's probably different for a particular disease, and it's probably different depending on the symptom that you're trying to target. So you can imagine what a big area of research this really is in terms of an undertaking that needs to be done. Um, my, my suggestion to my patients is usually, I'm afraid that you could get psychiatric or cognitive side effects, then I want you to be on a lower amount of THC. Simply say that THC is the part that's going to give you more psychiatric and cognitive side effects. However, THC is also the part that binds strongest to the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And so it may be important to have some THC, um, in which case maybe the best thing to do is to have a combination of CBD and THC where the THC is very low, where it's very minimal, and there's much more CBD. We know that CBD reduces the side effects of the THC, and so that might be the best way to go. But that's all theoretical. That's not based on good studies that have been done in any particular diseases and symptoms. So it's sort of self-directed and self-dosed and how many times you should use it and when you should use it. And all of this is a big open question. Um, and then there's the synthetics. There's the uh, lab-made forms of uh, drugs that bind to the CB receptors. And there's potential for research there. Could we eventually develop forms of, of cannabis or cannabis-like products that bind to these receptors only in the basal ganglia and not in the hippocampus, not in the cognitive centers, and not in the memory areas. Maybe that's an area that needs to be developed. So right now, the synthetic ones are uh, um, uh, the main ones that are being used in the studies, but they're not specific to specific areas of the brain. So. Uh, hopefully you've, you've gotten from this that cannabis receptors are widespread, and that's one of the main reasons that I think they should be studied. They're in the central nervous system, they're in the peripheral nervous system, they're in inflammatory cells. They may have many potential actions that they, that they could exhibit, but that also means that they may have many potential side effects based on their wide distribution. There are legitimate palliative uses, meaning uses for comfort, for things like appetite and pain, especially in people with very severe and advanced states of certain diseases. In terms of non-palliative uses, in certain circumstances, I think most doctors would argue that they're, that they're, that they're less harmful than some conventionally used medications. Certainly, when you compare their side effect profile to the side effects of things like narcotic pain medications, I think most people would agree that they may, be less, uh, they may lessen the need for potentially harmful medications. But whether they specifically treat things like spasticity, tremors, other things, that has not been concluded um, uh, based on the studies we have. And then the issues regarding safety and dosing that I've just covered need to be addressed. 
And recreational use is a whole other ethical discussion that I'm not ready to have here uh, about whether that should be continuing, and it is continuing, but whether that is appropriate or not. Um, there's a lack of consensus regarding the efficacy and, and also the side effects of the drug, and I think that that lack of consensus that you're probably feeling day to day reflects that there's a lack of knowledge and not enough high quality data to guide you because there's not enough to guide the doctors. Um, this, need, this I, to me, underscores the need for widespread education, um, education not just of, of the public but of the doctors, um, starting early on, earlier on in medical school, getting people interested in, in becoming experts on the topic and, and, and so that they feel comfortable eventually writing grants and, and, and submitting project uh, proposals. Um, we need well-designed trials to establish the evidence based on uh, the, the potential benefits and the potential negative effects not just in dystonia, but in specific symptoms of dystonia. So, so specifically looking at things like pain, like stiffness, like sleep, other problems. And then just remembering that there are state-specific policies and procedures that you need to, to look at within your own state and with your own doctors, um, but still kind of the federal guidelines is still not in, in line with what a lot of the states are doing. So that's all I've prepared for you. Um, I hope I've, I've answered some questions. I know I've left a lot of questions uh, open, uh, but, but I, I think that that's probably the best answer for some of those questions that, that you have that you're likely to get. Um, and hopefully more uh, answers will come in the coming uh, years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vega. That was really terrific, um, highlighting what we know. And, and certainly, clearly, um, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, and need to, to focus um, more research on. We've, we've got um, a number of um, really terrific questions. And before we dive into those, I just want to say that the DMRF strongly encourages anyone who is looking to pursue the um, medical cannabis as a, a way to manage their dystonia that they make sure they tell their doctor, just as they would with any other form of treatment, um, making sure that your doctor knows what you're doing. Um, it's important for your physician to have a full picture of, um, of what you're doing in addition to what they have prescribed for you. Um, so we had a number of questions on um, pediatric use of medical cannabis and um, is it safe for, for children and are there guidelines for um, how cannabis might help to benefit um, kids with dystonia or kids with other neurological disorders? So. Um that question is a little bit difficult for me to answer. As a uh, I, I'm as an adult neurologist, I only I only see adults. I don't see anybody uh, really under the age of 18. Um, but having said that, there are uh, there is a precedent for using it in children. Um, uh, there's a drug uh, Epidiolex, which just recently I want to say a year ago got approved. Um, for treating specific kinds of pediatric uh, epilepsies. Um, and so we, we know that, that there is some precedent for using cannabis products. Um, and safety studies have been done in those populations that, at least in that particular condition where it got approved, um, the risks uh, and benefit and ratio was in favor of using it for certain, for certain uh, children. And you have to think about the developing brain. Um, the developing brain is more susceptible Certainly, and so there maybe there are different long-term consequences to regular use in children than there would be in adults that need to be factored in, and I don't think we know that very well. Certainly with regard to addiction, we know that there's, good, there's some good evidence in the adolescent literature about cannabis use and potential for addiction, and you know, uh, there's theories about it as a gateway and, and other uh, problems that can be unique to children and adolescents. Um, so that needs to be factored in too. Um, but uh, I do think that there that um, it's a population where, in the right in the right circumstances, certainly people with severe generalized dystonias, which a lot of the pediatric dystonias uh, can be more generalized dystonias. Um, quality of life can be very poor in some people, um, and a lot of the medications that we're using are not the safest and uh, best tolerated. They're, they're sedating a lot of the benzodiazepines like clonazepam, a lot of the narcotic pain medications that some of these kids may end up needing, um, that you could certainly see how cannabis could be safer than some of those uh, options. Um, 
but it really needs to be uh, there really needs to be a good reason if you're going to use it in a, in a pediatric population would love to see good data to support it before I would recommend it but if I were seeing you know it would be on an individual individual basis um, I could see very good reasons why a doctor would say they don't feel comfortable in that population and I can see reasons why in certain situations especially severe forms why a, a doctor might consider uh, discussing that with a patient sure great thank you we, we you um, have a question about one of the studies that you mentioned um, regarding pain and, and cannabis. Um, did the study require uh, that there was daily or regular use of, the, of medical cannabis um, to get benefit, or was it just on an as-needed kind of basis? Yeah, the, in the study, it was required on a regular basis, um, and it was uh, it was every day, and it was multiple times a day, actually. It was I want to say it was, um, if it's a study that I'm thinking of that I showed, it was, it might have been three times a day. Um, I, and I know that one of the studies that was done in Parkinson's disease uh, was twice or three times a day as a standing regular thing. So yeah, people were, it was not as an as needed for the studies. Yeah. Okay, great. Could you t talk a little bit about what the difference is between CBD, CBD oil, THC, and hemp oil? I have a number of questions on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so CBD uh, is uh, when we when someone says CBD, they, they're specifically talking about one component of cannabis that is isolated, just CBD, meaning it doesn't have THC in it. Um, so THC is the main part of marijuana that gets people high, and that uh, that is not in CBD at all. So CBD would not get a person high. Um, THC is the part that binds the most to the cannabis receptors in the brain, um, and CBD doesn't bind as much to those cannabis receptors in the brain. Um, it does still bind to some important areas of the brain, which is why it may have some benefits on its own, um, but probably not as potent effects as what THC does um, on, on certain parts of the brain. And so, um, so it, it's been proposed that maybe CBD would have effects on things like anxiety or sleep, um, whether it would have effects on some of the motor symptoms that are really tied into the CB receptors um, by itself. We don't really know if it will. Um, it's, it might. Um, but that's one of the reasons why when a, a lot of people are using combinations of THC and CBD, because they want some effects of the THC, because that's the more potent effect. The CBD happens to lessen the side effects of the THC, um, and, uh, and that's why they're tried in combination a lot of the times. Um, CBD oils, those are uh, usually available over the counter, um, not even needing medical cards for the most part. Uh, people can just get them. They, um, uh, whether they, uh, how much of them gets into the brain versus how much of it, you know, you're just in ingesting and, and sort of excreting, we don't really know. Um, I will say that I've had lots of patients, this is all anecdotal, but lots of patients say that they use CBD oil and they feel like it helps with things like sleep or anxiety, but that's not, that's not evidence. And so I, I don't have uh, justification to, to tell other people that, that it definitely does that. Um, I would say that side effect wise, CBD certainly will have less side effects than THC. Um, but even at high, if you go to high enough concentrations of CBD, even that has been shown to have some side effects. Um, uh, gastrointestinal side effects, and uh, so it's not without side effects. Um, I think uh, that's probably um, the most I can say, just kind of generally about CBD and THC. Yeah, no, that's that's helpful. Um, how we have a question about how long you should try uh, medical cannabis before you just determine that it's just not working for you? Do you have any recommendations on that? Um, I, the simple answer is we don't know. Um, I would say um, certainly if, if someone's trying it and they're having um, any side effects, then I would not sort of push through those side effects. Certainly I would stop it. Um, the question is really, the question to me would be, if you have side effects or, or you're not getting benefits, should you keep trying it or should you try a different form, a different strain, a different concentration? If it were, you know, again, we don't have good ways to guide you on that. If it were me, 
I wouldn't keep using a form that doesn't work for me if I tried it uh, a few times. I would personally be trying a different, because uh, there are so many differences in different strains of different types. I would be thinking about whether I need a different strain, a different type, a different route. Um, but you don't have someone really reliable or respectable to guide you on that um, besides your dispensary person who may have their own agenda. So. Um, I think I think that's that's where it's sort of self-prescribing and self self-dosing, but I don't see a reason. Fundamentally, I can't see a reason why if if you've tried it once or twice, why it's suddenly going to start working the tenth time you try it. Um, I can't base that on evidence, but I don't see why it would. Right. Okay. Um, is there any? Um, do we know anything about the the long-term effects of of use of cannabis? Um, so we know uh, about, uh, we know a little bit. We know that there, I mentioned long-term kind of on cognition. Uh, there, for a while, people said that there were no long-term cognitive effects. It was all short-term. There are some long-term cognitive effects that are becoming more apparent. Um, specifically, I mentioned things like memory and attention and concentration. Um, there probably are long-term consequences to smoked forms. Um, the problem is, like personally, I think that the smoke forms might have less psychiatric side effects, um, but but there may be long-term negative effects on lung, uh, again, lung inflammation, uh, things like risk for emphysema. I, I mentioned that that's debated a little bit, but but still is something to worry about with long-term. Um, there there is a there, there is a risk. Uh, long-term use can be associated with some kind of addiction and withdrawal. Um, sometimes it's compared to things like caffeine. So with, you can't overdose in the sense that you can't, we don't, there's no evidence that you can kill yourself by taking too much cannabis um, in an overdose type of fashion, um, the way you can with like narcotics. But um, you can still get a withdrawal if you are on it for a long time and you stop it. You can get cranky, you can get irritable, you can get psychiatric symptoms. Um, some people describe that similar to if you stop drinking caffeine, you can get some of those symptoms. It may be similar to that. Uh, it may be more serious than that. But there, so there, there could be some potential for this sort of addictive need or this w a w a withdrawal, uh, maybe a need for a high, higher and higher amounts or doses to feel the same effect. Um, all of those are possibilities with long-term use. Great. And um, we, a couple of questions about um, the resources available for physicians. Um, one question is that, that their doctor is generally supportive but just doesn't know um, how to help them you know, find the right strain, the right dose. Um, what kind of resources are there for physicians who want to work with patients in medical cannabis? Um, well, there's a, the, the local dispensaries are the most open to helping. Um, they, they, they are willing to work with doctors and educate you and uh, work with the doctor on, on, on helping patients find the right regimen. I've had many um, offers from, from people working with patients that I've worked with who, who offer that. I just I don't know if many doctors feel comfortable with that as a source of information. I know that... I don't necessarily feel that comfortable with that as a source of information. Um, I like, I mean, I I appreciate hearing that, their information, but I don't know how much I trust it from a scientific standpoint. Um, but that's that's really the most available. Um, with other, there are courses every now and then. So there's uh, most of us, most physicians belong to some uh, societies like the for neurologists. We have the American Academy of Neurology. For movement disorders specifically, there's a movement disorder society. And within those, there's always um, uh, topics at, at meetings that cover cannabis. In the last five years, there's always been topics because it's been an area of interest. So there's usually sessions at those meetings that uh, are run by people who, again, have some experience uh, similar to what I have, some, some of them who have more, maybe more than what I have who will give talks um, to help guide people. So there's some, so there's some efforts to doing physician education at, at regular meetings that occur. Um, uh, that's probably the best we have right now. OK, yeah. All right. Is there any evidence um, to, that shows that it works uh, better for generalized dystonia versus a focal dystonia? Um, there is not. Uh, most of studies have been in focal dystonias. Most studies of dystonia in general are in focal dystonias just because there's so many more of them. It's so much easier to recruit them. 
Um, there, I don't see any reason uh, to think that it should uh, behave very differently um, in generalized versus focal. Um, we use the same, generally like the same medications, uh, like the conventional medications. They work in generalized and in focal dystonia. Um, the only exception really is botulinum toxin, which we don't usually use for generalized, but we use mainly for focal problems, only because it would be hard to do injections of the whole body. Um, but in general, the, the same medications tend to, to work for this, for generalized and focal. Okay. And actually, we have a question about um, whether or not, if you're receiving botulinum toxin injections, is there any reason um, to not try medical cannabis for symptoms? Um, I mean, I'll say again specifically that I'm not, I'm not recommending specifically that anyone uses it. Uh, I think again, it's individual individual basis, but I see no uh, I see no reason that botulinum toxin would be uh, a factor in your decision making. We had a couple questions around how um, people might be able to get a medical cannabis card. Um, and I know it varies by state. Um, and we would just recommend that uh, actually you can just Google it. How can I get a medical marijuana card in and then fill in the state? Um, and it'll give you um, directions for those states that actually have um, medical cannabis um, available. So um, as you mentioned in your presentation, all of these things vary by state. So, um, uh, but, but that information is readily available online. Um, so just another question about um, physicians and um, possibly maybe pushing um, or ur urging the Food and Drug Administration to sort of pursue this. Um, the question is really related. Um, to insurance coverage. Actually, we received a number of questions and comments about the cost of the use of medical cannabis. Um, any insights as to um, sort of what people can do about that, how we might be able to encourage this issue to, to be examined so that it might be covered by insurance? Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm obviously biased as a physician and a scientist that I would say that I would use the, your, your, if you're motivated enough, um, I would use those, I would use that motivation and that power that people have to persuade, uh, number one, a change in taking it and, and not making it a, a scheduled one substance. That would be the, the very first thing that needs to change is um, a scheduled one uh, controlled substance is, is one that has no proof, no evidence or even theoretical evidence of medical purpose or use, which clearly cannabis does not belong in that category. Um, and basically it says that it's only harmful and has no benefit. Um, if you look at the other things that are Schedule 1, it, it really is, is, it makes no sense that cannabis is in that category. So that's the first step that has to happen. It has to not be a Scheduled 1. Number two would be uh, to fight uh, for, it, for, for more funding for uh, research in it. And whether that means first making it, uh, you know, taking away the federal regulations on it, or even if there are federal regulations, still allowing people to have easier access and, and uh, to, uh, to when they do get, when they do have grant ideas and they do have uh, studies that they want to do, to not be as limited in the kinds that they can use and in the quantities that they can use and the strains that they can use. That will be, the, that's, that's going to be helpful. In terms of the question about, I, I understand where the question is coming from uh, about how do we get it uh, so that insurances will cover it and approve it, um, you know they're going to go by they're going to go by evidence. Even with even with more conventional drugs, insurance companies aren't going to pay for people to use drugs that aren't that they don't have good evidence for. Even a drug that gets that has FDA approval, they're not insurance company is not going to pay for you to use it for an off often for an off label indication for a lot of the time. So they, they go by the evidence, um, and they're gonna they're gonna stick by that. I don't think that that, that any argument is gonna work for them that's not evidence based. So I think you have to start with I think you have to start with the evidence, um, and uh, and convince them that way. So that's gonna take longer. Uh, it's not an easy route. Um, I think, and, and actually, to, you know, to be clear, I don't know that, it, that there's any way to legalize something. Um, to, to approve something, to actually say that this is an approved indication, to say that uh, dystonia is a, an on-label approved indication for cannabis, 
without the studies to support it, right? So we're sort of bypassing the normal route that things go through to get approved and for insurance to get covered by saying, well, people are already using it and we're going we're gonna to learn from the people who are using it. But it's not gone through the normal process of uh, showing the studies and showing the data. So it's unlikely that any like company will show a label that it works for a disease just based on reports. It's, you're going to need studies. The way Epidiolex got approved for epilepsy is they did, they did well-designed studies to show that, that this form of cannabis work and now it's approved and I, i'm sure I, I don't have experience with it but i'm sure that insurance is covering it for those people who have seizures so it has to start there right right thank you thank you well i want to be mindful of um of the time um you've been very generous tonight we are so grateful to you for the information that you shared um, uh, thank you so much and thanks to everyone who offered a question um, we will do our best to um, provide um, information on this going forward um, thank you so much dr. Bega this was terrific my pleasure good night everyone thank you bye-bye